pleased to be hosting our fifth event on building with natural materials, focusing this time on low carbon foundations. We've got some great minds from across the industry presenting tonight, followed by a panel session where the speakers will be able to answer your questions posted in the chat box. So I'd like to introduce Beth Williams. Beth is a structural engineer at Build Collective and will introduce the principle of foundations. Steve Webb from Webby Yates Engineer will talk us through his work on stone and timber foundations. Then Ben Bosens from Local Work Studio will present some of his projects, including one in collaboration with Toby McLean, who will then round up with some case studies. Before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN and some are involved in the network. But for the benefit of the others in the room, I will give you a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. For anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Formed in April 2019, it has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started as a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration, and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more about these here and on the Aiken website. Aiken is made up of many groups, including these nine thematic groups of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen, and a couple of people from each group take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and any actions. You can hear more about what else is going on, on in the other groups by joining ACAN, and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box. I'll now hand over to Steph to introduce the speakers. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, nice to see so many people from uh, various different places, uh, including Rotterdam. So hello from across the water. Um, so we're going to kick off uh, with Beth Williams from Build Collective. Beth's a chartered civil engineer and certified passive house designer. And she's also an associate at Build Collective, which is a bespoke engineering consultancy based in Bristol. Beth has over 10 years experience in low energy and low carbon design and construction, focusing on timber frame passive house buildings. Her project experience ranges from domestic extensions to new build sports halls and high security NHS facilities. Alongside practice work, Beth is a vis visiting tutor at Bath, Cardiff and UWE architecture schools and a group leader for the AECB Bristol and Bath local group. Beth is passionate about making low energy buildings simple to build, affordable and available to all. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction on um, basically on foundations as a as a structure as a whole, um, and how we different types of foundations and how we go about choosing an appropriate type of foundation for a given site, obviously with a focus on the sort of um, concrete free low carbon options. Um, so we're just going to start from there. So if we've got our building, our, our little passive house building here it is um and we we want to start thinking about how we go about um designing the the foundation so the foundations in a basic term are the part of the structure that design that transfers the loads from the above ground structure into the ground so if we're wanting to look at that first we need to know um something about our above ground structure so we need to know the loading on it we want to know the vertical loads that are coming down these are the sort of common ones that people know about sort of the materials loads the people loads of uh, people using the building snow loads those kind of things and we've also got horizontal loads to take down into foundations those are com most commonly wind loads but there's also other horizontal loads that come into things like setting out tolerances um, and we want to take those into account. And then another one is um, that can be uh, critical is uplift. So if you've got things like large um, overhangs, flat roofs, generally, if you're using timber buildings and you've got racking um, loads, those kind of things, they they can put, um, it produce uplift loads onto your foundation. And so if we want to transfer all of those into the foundation, we need to be able to design our foundation to take all of those loads um, and just and react to all of those things in a in a suitable way so that our building stays where we put it, essentially. So, yeah, we've got the one thing that we've got here. We've got that we need to know. We need to know about the um, above ground superstructure loadings. 
And then we've got the next thing we need to know about is whether our ground can take those loadings. So those are the sort of two things we're basically needing to know in order to be able to choose a suitable foundation system. So how do we go about choosing a foundation system? So we've got our foundation loadings that we talked about. These could be area loads, they could be line loads, they could be point loads. And we want to know about all of those, which direction they're acting, all of that kind of thing. Um, and we want to know where they apply in the building. We want to know how big they are. And another thing we can think about if we're looking at foundations, particularly if we're thinking about foundations in a slightly different way to sort of would be common, is thinking about what kind of allowable deflections we're OK with. What, how much are we OK with our above ground structure moving before it might cause a problem to its to to its built its users? Um, so we've got those allowable deflections. Commonly, that's a sort of 25 millimeter tolerance, but maybe for a, something like a timber building, a straw building, maybe we're allowing a bit more movement in our foundations in order that we can do something slightly different. So that's that's um, those are the things we need to know about the, the above ground loading. And then what we, we need to know what we're building on. Um, this is um, the publicly available British Geological Survey maps um, and that's the area where I work in a lot um, so that's Bath area which has got all sorts of weird things going on in the ground and then you can start to see the Bristol area up the um, the top left there of the of the screen where with the coal fields coming in so um, that's a good quote from the Institute of Civil Engineers you pay for a site investigation whether you get one or not um, and I have generally found that to be true particularly if you're wanting to do something slightly odd in the ground um that is that is less common and you're wanting to convince people like building control that you, what you're doing is is reasonable um so i generally say that if you're doing anything above like a smallish um domestic extension you're going to be wanting to get um uh, some kind of geotechnical specialist advice in in order to design your your foundations there um so yeah, if it's a new built house, you might be going down the full route of a full uh, stage two site investigation. But if it, if it's a smaller project, you might want to just get a geotechnical engineer to inspect trial pits or that kind of thing. Get some get some lab samples. But getting getting a good site investigation is really key to being able to do slightly weird things with the foundations. Um, and then, yeah, you've got different types of, of um, soils and rocks there. So generally we talk about a, a, a very broad view about geotechnics. We talk about rocks, we talk about granular soils, which are um, sands and gravels. Um, and then we talk about cohesive soils, which are clays. We've got different foundations that can be suitable on those different types of, of ground conditions. Other things that might affect your foundation choice are, are you building near trees? Are you building near existing buildings? And then things like contamination, slope stability, made ground, lots of things can be going on in the ground. And um, just to give you some perspective, lots of things going on in the, in our area, just in that very small area, we've got rocks, we've got sands and gravels, and we've got clays and we've got trees and we've got coal mining and we've got slope stability issues. So there's lots of things that can be happening in a very small area um, that we just want to make sure that we've got enough information about in order to design the foundations appropriately. So that's that. And then once we've got a good picture of what, what our building looks like and what the loadings look like, what our site looks like, and what the ground conditions are, then we can start thinking about what types of foundations might be suitable for our site. So generally, you've got two overall um, types of foundation. You've got shallow foundations, which are generally less than three metres below ground level, although I'd probably say less than sort of two metres below ground level to be able to dig them safely. And then you've got deep foundations, which are predominantly piling um, in this case. So things that are going um, over three metres below the ground level there. And then you've got a slight um, in, in between category there, ground improvement techniques, which can be used to take a site that would have originally required um, deep foundations into a site that can get away with shallow foundations. So you've got something in the middle there. And then just to sort of finish off some examples of what might be, and some of the others are going to talk about these in, in more detail. So I'm just going to sort of stick that on the screen a little bit there to sort of see some different examples in the different um, categories there, different types of piling, different types of spread foundations, some sort of ground improvement techniques there going on in the middle for different types of soils there. 
Um, so that's me mostly done. And then just to final thing to point out, if you're working on an existing um, site, particularly urban sites, you might have some existing foundations in the ground. And there's a BRE guide as to how you might go about designing your foundations for, for the new structure. So that's all. And I'll hand over to the others to go into more detail on some of those different types of foundation. Brilliant. Thanks, Beth. That's great. And um, that British Geological Survey map is really useful, so I'll definitely be looking at that later. Thank you. Um, OK, so on to our next speaker. Actually, just before our next speaker, if you have any questions for Beth um, on her presentation or things you want to ask her about, please post them in the chat. Um, and we've got a Q&A session at the end uh, where we're hoping to kind of have a bit more lively discussion about the things people have spoken about. So feel free to, to ask Beth questions. Um, so on to the next speaker, we've got Steve Webb from Webb Yates, um, whose name precedes him. Uh, he's Steve's a structural engineer, I'm sure you know, he founded Webb Yates Engineers with Andy Yates um, in 2005. Steve has pioneered the practices approach to innovation and sustainability, encouraging the use of non-conventional materials from cast iron to cork and from inflatables to stone to design low carbon and environmentally conscious structures. In 2020, he was award awarded the Mill Medal for continuously challenging and redefining what's considered possible in structural design. So Steve re regularly lectures at universities and events and has taught at the AA, RCA and Bartlett and written for multiple industry magazines, which is where we found him, uh, including VD and the RVA Day and has judged various awards, including the RVA and iStruck D. So thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll make my talks longer than your introduction. Great. So um, uh, I have a sort of mixture of um, uh, kind of more philosophical wondering about foundations and building in general and a little bit of practical advice uh, foundations. Um, a lot of what we do in construction is based on rationalization and the avoidance of human labor and the relationship between the cost of um, of labor and the cost of material really is in favor of material. And so we tend all the time not just with foundations, but with most parts of buildings to heavily rationalize to avoid having to employ people. So we pour lots of concrete into slabs and columns and flat slabs instead of coffered slabs. And um, so I'm always wondering if you, for example, moved the income tax from the people onto the material as a tax burden, suddenly you would want to spend more money on people rather than on materials. And you would spend time making far more intricate and more lightweight structures. And this nervy building is an example of this where there's clearly an expedience in spending a lot of money on, on shuttering and on design uh, in order to save concrete at that time after the Second World War when coal was in short supply. So there's no difference between that and foundations. So we have a huge tendency to, um, and I'm, I'm talking mainly about small, small buildings, um, I think there's a particular wastage in small buildings actually where we will build small houses, small homes and extensions and we'll tend to dig deep trench footings um, and as Beth was saying, um, so with, I'm thinking primarily about clay cohesive soils, so where you have a risk of trees desiccating the ground and the ground moving, you tend to dig very deep trench foundations and then and, and wide enough for a bucket of a digger to fit in to save time um, and then flood that with concrete. So it's the quickest way of getting foundations in the ground and then put down some kind of mesh and pour a concrete slab over the top of that. So this, um, this is a little comparison um, for scenarios based on a 15 by 10 meter two-story house. So on the very left-hand side, the lazy option with the strip footing and the, and the in-situ slab has 50 tons of CO2 associated with the foundations. So we um, have frequently designed amazingly environmentally friendly timber buildings and then plonked them on foundations, the slabs like this, and all of the carbon is in the ground and everything you did on top is really um, a slight waste of effort when the the elephant in the room was um, was underneath. Um, so we started to move away from strip footings. It's incredibly easy to put in intermittent pins and the continuous strip footing has way, way more capacity than any kind of medium rise building would, um, would need. So going for intermittent um, pin and uh, pillar and beam type 
footings where you dig a small hole in the ground and span the slab in between, that brings your carbon footprint for that particular building down from 50 tons to 20 tons, which is a huge saving. The third option, um, all uh, or many of us are living in Victorian houses with timber ground floors, and some of those ground floors are rotting and need to be repaired, but many of them are absolutely fine, and many of them are not very well ventilated. So um, uh, also the NHBC has guidance on timber ground floors. I think many new builds are built with timber ground floors. All American houses are built with timber ground floors. So, so there's a certain allergicness based on durability for timber ground floors, but actually getting rid of the slab not only has the benefit of removing all of that concrete, but it also has the benefit of lightening the building and allowing you to have a much lighter foundation. So having a, it also means that um, uh, so maybe you don't have a brick skin that needs a continuous strip underneath it. So you can have intermediate or intermittent foundations with a timber timber ground floor in between. The uh, in the 1950s we would have dug a hole and poured a bit of concrete down the bottom of the hole, and then we would have built a brick pier up to support the building rather than flood the entire hole with concrete. And that's because people were mixing the concrete manually. And it was really hard work, uh, whereas now they order it off the back of a concrete wagon and so they can pour huge volumes of concrete in the ground without any consequence to them. But um, actually just having, say, 300 mil of concrete at the bottom of a hole and building a brick pier or something on top is going to reduce the concrete volume again massively. Um, there's no reason why you can't switch that concrete for stone so stone has something like one third of the carbon footprint of concrete depending on where you get it from and it will be highly durable and there's a lot of waste stone um being around in quarries that they can't sell because it's got uh discoloration or whatever so moving it to stone means that we come from 50 tons on the left hand side to 0 0.56 tons for the entire ground floor of the building so one hundredth of the carbon footprint um, and I'm also looking in that example at um, screw piles. So screw piles were a kind of great solution or a, 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 it's about to be a great sustainable solution. Um, actually, the screw piles have a higher carbon footprint at 1.6 tonnes, although that's all pretty, pretty moot point compared to the 50 tonnes in the first place. But you can remove the screw piles afterwards. I don't know whether anyone would actually get to the point of doing that. Um, and also the screw piles don't create any spoil. So there's some benefit. Um, in that sense. We've also been looking at driven timber piles and we've tried to introduce it on three or four projects and always had too many client concerns over durability. So I'm always telling them that they're continuously digging Roman piles out of the river in London um, from uh, a thousand years ago, but that doesn't really um, convince people and we need some better, better code justifications for the durability of timber piles. Um, so on a less practical level, another thing that I wanted to just float was that um, we tend to design, so in London, almost all of Victorian London is built on completely inadequate non-compliant foundations. So maybe 500 millimeter deep corbels footing, so absolutely tiny foundations. And all of those buildings are susceptible to ground movement. But susceptible doesn't mean that the ground movement happens. And so in a typical Victorian street, maybe one in 10 or one in 15 houses has had some kind of ground movement. And if that ground movement hasn't arrested or cured itself, which is normally the case, then very occasionally some of those buildings are underpinned. Our approach today, and it's an approach based on risk, is that we want to make all buildings completely immune to any possible ground movement, which means that we stick two and a half meter deep foundations under every single every single building, strip footings all over the place. And um, obviously the cure is worse than the disease. In this case, um, much, much cheaper to um, collectivize the risk and go for an inadequate foundation and go around fixing them when they go wrong than it is to make every foundation 100% proof. So um, I don't know how you would do that. It needs some kind of insurance, some sort of insurance based collectivization of which. Uh, of um of risk approach so I, this is not practical advice this is just kind of you know how do we treat risk in building we're we're too risk averse and we spend too much money trying to avoid risks that um uh barely ever happen um and finally just a word on so we do a lot of basements and things um 
a word on form. So when um, so we do a lot of uh, experiments with our students on finding forms. So what hangs upside down uh, stands up the right way up, and um, this is true in the ground. So if found if uh, engineers are building foundations, um, no, if engineers are building anything underground, in fact they build circular circular sewers, circular tube tunnels, circular shafts and tubes, circular grain silos, all sorts of different circular structures. And the reason is that the soil pressure acts from all around and a circular structure is incredibly efficient to um, to resist those forces so if you have a 20 meter square rectangular basement it probably has a 600 millimeter thick wall if 20 millimeter circle it could probably have a 150 millimeter thick wall there's a huge improvement in um in material efficiency if you change the form and this is just an example of a recent project that we've been working on where we're using uh, this is actually a, um, a underground vaulted structure, and um, we are looking at the reversal of forces. So something that works in tension also works in compression. The balloon works in tension with an internal pressure in exactly the same way as it would work in compression with an external structure. So we're designing a very thin stone vault to form a meter wide underground structure, uh, which you can see being built. Yeah, using the balloon as a basic form finding exercise. If we, and I should say, all that sheet piling is being taken out afterwards. So, um, so that's just to enable the, um, the thing to be built in that way. But I think there's a lot of, and this is maybe too, slightly too fancy, even for my taste, to be honest. But I think um, we uh, we could certainly improve the forms of a lot of underground structures, circular basements elliptical basements, uh, horizontal vaults in the basements will all save uh, lots and lots and lots of concrete and reduce the carbon footprint of, of building those structures. That's the end. Thanks, Steve. That was brilliant. I mean, I think that could have been a whole uh, a whole talk in itself. Um, I mean, there's so much there. And I think we've all just collectively agreed we need to have a stone event um, because we haven't had one yet in the kind of natural materials world. And there's just so much content. Um, and I think your approach to risk is really interesting and definitely something that natural materials world uh, kind of holistically is looking at uh, and struggling with. Um, so it does need to be addressed. So, yeah, really interesting. And just I will hand over now to Ben and Sean, who will be talking about Timber Power Foundation. So um, just to kind of pick up on that thread. Um, so I'd like to introduce Ben, um, who's the co-founder of Local Work Studio and designer committed to applying circular economy principles and processes. Uh, he brings his enthusiasm for reuse, repair and knowledge of material invention to any project, designing new materials, structures, finishes and processes to suit any scale and application. Uh, prior to forming Local Work Studio, Ben created and ran a well-respected building conservation company for 15 years, repairing vernacular buildings throughout the UK and Europe. Uh, Ben's creative practice was informed by an education at the RCA in London, and he continues to research and innovate within a specialist field, developing new architectural and landscape-led design projects, working with local materials, waifs, and crafts and people. At uh, Local Work Studio, Ben leads on material design and fabrication, material research, reuse and repair. And today he's joined by Sean, also from Local Work Studio, who's bridged the gap between architect, designer and builder. So I'll hand over to Ben and Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hello, yeah, I'm like been frantically making notes. It's been really interesting so far. Um, I'll just share my screen. So kind of, kind of quite beautifully segueing on from um, Steve's talk, I think it's kind of become quite common knowledge now that um, a lot of Venice um, was built on, on timber piles and specifically Alder timber, um, which kind of amazingly and has this real longevity uh, when in this kind of anaerobic silt environment where it's, it's driven into the silt. Um, and this could support bridges, masonry bridges and masonry buildings that you see um, in Venice. And it's really quite an amazing discovery and technique. Um, but we are going to present um, quite a humble <laughs> project, which is, which is live and we're working on at the moment. And Sean's been part of the design team and also, uh, crucially, I think, an interest in the um, is building as well, so architect and builder. Um, and also Toby is joining us, the structural engineer for this project, and he's also presenting a bit uh, at the end of this um, evening as well. So 
local at studio we you know we kind of really are very very concerned with hyper local construction uh, maintenance and repair and we always start each project with a mapping exercise and it's kind of look it's an audit it's looking at kind of subsoils uh, potential excavation materials but also people uh, what are their skills in the area um, is there processing machinery that can, can we can get into is the sawmills you know what are the crafts which are happening? What are the vernacular traditions of the area? Because that can kind of give rise and kind of um, help us to design new buildings, even though we're not trying to kind of do some kind of reenactment. It's more looking at real kind of ingenuity with materials, um, which did happen in the past, um, and how creative people were with such a limited palette of resources. So we're talking about... Um, today about a building uh, which is in the southeast of England uh, not this map is not actually for the project but it's a similar area of the country and it's kind of in the low weald which is this band of alternating clays and sands um, and specifically it's a it's an old brick brickwork site so it's an old clay pit um, and it's a campsite so we've we were asked to design a new uh, shower block toilet block for a campsite and Really, it's in quite an amazing place where there's an old railway line, as seen in this slide, um, that cuts north-south through the site. Um, and it has this, you know, it's now been kind of, it's no longer a railway line, but it's now kind of taking through electricity and pylons, um, connecting different villages. So I think our inspiration kind of started with, A, there were quite a few timber poles uh, on the site that had been taken out as the poles were replaced. But really kind of, seeing their their construction and understand that, that they weren't there's no concrete in a foundation for a telegraph pole it was kind of really interesting for us to think about could could there be a building built in this way um and we had to make it was a very low cost building it was kind of uh the brief was was low cost and we therefore also i don't know if you can see this amazing book called low cost pole building construction american uh, from 1980s, so this is really, really cool if anyone is interested. Um, so the telegraph pole was kind of picked by us as something which is way, way cheaper than, than kind of new, even coppiced um, timber. Um, it has a toxic legacy in that these are boiled in creosote when they are first um, put out to be a pole. So we did have to go through building control to satisfy their kind of problems with the creosote. Um, and also it has helped that we designed a building which is very open, there's no walls. Uh, there's also partly, only partly roofed, so it's kind of a fully ventilated space that's only used in the summer. Um, but we were focusing on using these telegraph poles, which are very cheap, and they'd come to the end of their life as a pole. Uh, they were sourced locally, but also on the site as well. So the first sketches were really kind of trying to think of how we could elevate this shower building off the ground, which is this kind of sort of can be a very muddy kind of site. And we wanted this wash house to be clean and elevated off the ground. And we sort of very quickly were thinking about the way that these telegraph poles could be situated into the ground. Um, we were quite keen to kind of reference the fact that it was a brickworks and we, could, we were looking at kind of crushed brick aggregate as well um, in order to set the poles in place. Um, but actually, they then became. Oh, hang on, sorry. Yeah, so this is the the kind of the start of the works and laying out, setting out the building. Um, you can probably just about, if you can see my cursor, you can see a darker black shade on the pole, and this is a bitumen sleeve that had to be wrapped around the pole at sort of six hundred mil yeah. below the ground to satisfy the water table effectively. Yeah. So the poles go deeper than that, and Toby will explain the exact kind of build up of cross section through the through the pole. But yeah, there's a bitumen sleeve, um, but otherwise it is got compacted aggregates around the pole itself, um, and you can still see the amazing font which is kind of uh, routed onto these telegraph poles. We're we're hoping to develop some signage from the project which is developed around the font, and these guys with a little router that. Route and encode each pole. Um, but these horizontal timbers were, were milled in half. So we had the, the vertical poles and then Sean milled them in half to create these kind of sub joists. It's another way of kind of keeping it cheap throughout the structure. 
Have I missed Toby's slide? One second. Yes, I have. Toby, are you there? I'm here. I'm, I'm unmuted now as well. Uh, yes, thanks. So, well, this is a sketch of the technical sketch um, of, um, and this is as far as the technical drawings went. We didn't we didn't do CAD drawings. Um, a technical sketch for the foundation. It's it's derived from what we've done a lot for playgrounds of all things, um, where we often stick posts in the ground. And uh, the bitumen sleeve referred to is protecting the bit of the pole, which is at most risk of the K, which is where it stays wet and it has access to oxygen. So that's at ground level, below ground level, or near ground level, whether it's above or just below. Um, the, is, in this case, is the, the poles were boiled in creosote before their first life, which is a fairly effective preservative treatment can't usually be used in buildings because it's not a nice thing for animals and people to, to ingest. Um, and uh, Mendes explained how <clears throat> uh, they've uh, approached that in this case. Uh, so, and this is a really important point, you do have to be careful about what timber you're using in the ground. You cannot just stick any timber in the ground. Um, and most timbers would, would require additional protection at the ground level interface. The good news is though, that uh, at the bottom of this note, you can see lateral load design is to CD354. So this is a codified approach. CD354 is a highways uh, manual design guidance for minor structures near highways. So it's a kind of way that um, a lamppost might be planted in the ground, for example. Um, and the backfill for that, again, the notes in the drawing there, backfill class eight material to uh, it's a, a strange code, MCDHWS, which is a highway works specification, um, is pretty much any earth. It excludes some things like lumps of clay, um, but it's not an exotic aggregate. Um, so really super cheap foundation, uh, foundation if you can over a hole big enough to let the, um, the timber post in and a compacted backfill around it, that's your foundation. I'll talk more about timber a bit more than I do my stint after the Ben's talk. Thanks, Toby. That's great. I think it's kind of interesting <clears throat> at this point to talk about the aggregate itself because I guess part of our kind of um, methodology would be always to try and source the aggregate locally as well. So Sean found this recycled aggregate, but equally that you know may not be relevant elsewhere. You could look to kind of quarry waste and it could be a pure stone natural aggregate. Um, but in this place, it made sense to use recycled aggregate. Um, and I think full disclosure, I'm going to say here as well, we did add some cement to the, the base pad that the pole sat on. So Toby's design was originally to use a broken paving slab uh, or a kind of a piece of existing concrete that could be cut out of somewhere and added at the base of the pit. Um, but we didn't have any, and Sean's kind of choice was really they're going to buy buy a new one or yeah i mean i well i tested it out we obviously dug the first hole with the uh, ground worker alley and um also just sourcing these pavers was was actually really difficult to find it to the right spec that toby was saying mm. and and then i found that they were being delivered from different companies just basically outside our sort of perimeter yeah, maps mapping. of what we wanted to keep it within within East Sussex effectively. So um, we figured out a method that um, we would only have to add really small amounts of cement to a compacted dry mix at the bottom um, of the hole, which allowed only, there were only two or three of us on site and we were compacting it by hand. Um, so the whole labor side of things went into the design of these holes as well but I obviously made sure on site I gave Toby a call um <laughs> to see if that was going to be okay um <laughs> at the end of the day but and it was and um yeah and like Ben said like we we found sources for recycled type one to um compact into the hole um and that's the thing around I don't know where you are um in East Sussex I'm finding that there are a few companies who are sort of trying to branch out and provide these kind of materials because people are asking for them now that, you know, there are these companies popping up that can provide the materials now, which is 
um, separate from getting it from a builder's merchant or something like that. So. Mm -hmm. And I think also kind of good to point out that this way of building, uh, you're, you're basically cantilevering, I hope I'm getting this right, Toby, you're cantilevering the post because uh, it's buried. Mm. So you therefore need no bracing above above ground. It's kind of quite a nice. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. So there's there's no bracing in the building. So if the, the stability is from the cantilever telegraph poles. So I'll just quickly go through the slides. And we have uh, obviously the auger here digging the holes for the posts, uh, the first post going in. And you can see sort of how how many posts were required underneath the deck, um, and the posts and the telegraph poles in the background. Um, the the deck itself was made with coppice chestnut, um, new green timber, so that was um, cut and milled very locally. Uh, a lot of the cladding for the project um, was re kind of excess from other building projects. Um, so we've got this kind of different layers of. I guess reuse plus local coppice timber for the whole building. Um, and you can see here it's slightly beginning to come together, part roofed, hardly any walls, um, uh, showers and toilets for the campsite. Okay, I'll leave it there. I think I might have run over. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you. And I think it is really important to just touch on the practicalities of, uh, of and buildability of, of these things. So yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. If you do have any questions for Beth or for Steve or for Ben and Sean, um, please do put them in the chat. Um, so on to our last speaker, who's Toby. Um, we've had a little cameo already from Toby, but just to give him his full introduction, he is a structural engineer with a diverse career, uh, engineering everything from oil platforms and concert halls to handbags. Having sold his previous firm, Tall Engineers, in 2020, Toby established Alt Environmental to atone for past carbon sins and to address the urgent need to decarbonise the built environment, especially in relation to embodied carbon. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. So, yes, I'm Toby McLean. This is uh, my company's Alt. Uh, we're environmental structure engineers in that we try and do th things with least harm to the environment, and particularly uh, I've been concentrating on minimising embodied carbon in buildings. And as has been noted, foundations are one of the largest causes of emissions of embodied carbon uh, in buildings. Generally speaking, the less you do in the ground, the better. Um, it's very hard, for example, to do a basement in a low carbon way. Um, and But here are some ways, um, with some examples given, of some lower carbon foundations. Uh, and in no particular order, I'm going to start with uh, compacted stone foundations. Uh, so this mimics a concrete filled trench, but without the concrete. So uh, in fact, it's, you know, the aggregate in the concrete is largely like the stone in these trenches. Um, it's, there are precautions you should be taking. It won't always be suitable on all sites. Um, for example, we don't really want um, water coming into these and staying and freezing. Um, you don't want to be excavating alongside these in a haphazard manner because they will collapse. But then that's no worse than excavations by a shallow Victorian brick footing, for example, where you'd also have to excavate with care adjacent to it. Um, in the uh, example shown here on this page, we have um, two sketch um, details from the same building, uh, which is kind of a stone and timber. Uh, building in also in Sussex, coincidentally, um, and really trying to minimise the um, the concrete. I should say, by the way, it's, it's another unheated building, um, so don't be too surprised by the lack of insulation underneath the internal slab, which is on the left hand side of these sketches. Uh, the geotextile wrapped around these trenches, which is the red dash line in your sketches, is to stop the um, foundation filling up with fines, so small bits of sand and soil. Um, and I'm suggesting in these sketches that you would slope, to, you'll always keep water out, you'd slope the bottom of the trenches, and at the lowest point, hopefully, your topo topography allows you to drain that water somewhere else on site, and often you'll find you can't do that. Um, there are sometimes solutions for those cases. I won't go into the details now, um, but generally speaking, it's keeping the water out is the important thing. 
Here's two examples on site. So on the left hand side is a small London extension. Uh, and this was by a builder who was, who'd never done this before, but he was very keen and happy to give it a go. Um, doing a good job. Uh, and just showing that, you know, you can use it on any size project. On the right hand side, it's a, a building from quite some time ago, like many of my projects in Crete. Um, it's a two story, it looks like a timber frame house and it is, but it was in filled with straw bale. Uh, so it's common, locally known as a straw, straw house. And Crete is quite a seismic area. And these were stone foundations with a two story timber building in filled with straw on a, in a seismic, a seismic location. So, so it, it, it's quite a wide range of ap ap applications uh, you can use these for. The stone plinth in this case above ground was mortared together. Another subset of that is um, uh, gravel field tires. Uh, we did a project again quite a few years ago now in, in Thailand. There was an influx of refugees from Burma um, who their children needed education and a charity uh, we were involved in built them a school. And it was designed to be movable. Uh, and in fact, it has moved since it was built. And the foundation solution were these stacked tires, which they got from a, a truck dealership nearby for free, uh, filled with um, filled with gravel. You can see in this picture uh, people having fun building those things. Uh, and actually, in the in the let's see the the middle top photo, um, just a shot of the steel post that went in there with a the cruciform base to stop them punching through the gravel. So there's no concrete base like we had at, um, at the secret campsite that Ben was talking about, just a cruciform base to, to spread the load onto the gravel bed. Moving on to steel screw piles or steel piles, well, steel screw piles, um, and they're principally two types. On the left, um, helical steel screw piles, which is probably what most engineers are talking about when they talk about steel screw piles and on the right what I've labeled as ground screws uh, and you can see how they look very different uh, the helical ones have this wide um, helical shaped plate um, at, at least one location along its length um, can be two three four uh, so you can increase capacity by adding additional plates whereas the ground screws tend uh, on the right hand side look much more like a wood screw but a giant size uh, the helical ones will give you a much higher capacity um, and a kind of more um, more susceptible to design as well. Um, it's one of the one of the key things in steel screw piles is it's it's not an, uh, as well developed industry as other types of piling. So contractors engaged in installing steel screw piles won't always be as uh, used to uh, installing piles for buildings and worrying about building regulations and so forth. So it is important to take care that, um, as Beth was uh, correctly saying, a, a site investigation is uh, undertaken. Uh, it is possible to avoid that if you are, there are this provision in Eurocode 7, the piling Eurocode, um, to, to establish capacity by testing piles. It's different to the pile test you would do if you want to check the pile you've put in is okay. Uh, in, in broadly speaking, you would apply about twice as the twice the load you would do to a normal pile test, so three times a working load, as opposed to say one and a half times. Um, but a ground investigation would always give the best results for those. Uh, there are other issues potentially with um, steel screw piles in terms of, um, and the next slide you'll see one example where it doesn't stick above ground. You'll, uh, sometimes you end up with these uh, steel piles sticking above ground. Um, and again, you need to be very careful about lateral loads on those piles then because you're bending a quite a thin uh, steel tube um, uh, kind of out of the ground. Uh, these steel piles are often sort of three inch diameter. Uh, they come in any size, but they start about three inches. So quite, quite flimsy things. And in all the, and in fact, I should have prefaced this by saying in all these, um, cases where we're trying to do low carbon foundations is always the edge conditions which which drive the whole design it's how the building meets the ground next to the building um, and 
it tends to change quite a lot, especially on a tight site like this one. This was a, again another London extension, um, where th there are various um, edge conditions to a new ground floor. There's the against existing structure, against potentially higher ground, against lower ground. Um, and so it's it's really important to thoroughly work your way around around that kind of area, uh, establishing how each separate part is going to work. And uh, the pictures here is trying to show the different conditions that are being dealt with and the slightly strange, potentially haphazard looking arrangement of steel ground beams that we used. Now we have done projects with timber ground beams on steel piles. Um, in those cases, we've been able to keep the timber well away from the ground. Uh, but in these cases where the, the ground beams are much more closely related to the ground, we, we would tend to use steel ones. And these are all galvanized. Um, you might also consider additional protection on the galvanized steel, depending on the ground conditions um, and, uh, and exactly how they're situated. Uh, moving on to timber piles, uh, we've seen these um, before. This is a picture of Ben's project, Ben and Sean's project, the campsite. Um, and we also touched on, uh, I think Steve touched on timber ground floor. So timber suspended ground floor is by far the lowest carbon uh, ground floor you can achieve of any available option. Um, and they lend themselves quite well to timber piles. Um, what we're showing here is an all good timber pile. So a hole is dug, um, some kind of base put in, the post put into the hole and then backfilled. It is of course possible to um, drive uh, timber piles into the ground. Um, and the next slide refers to the some guidance on that. So the BRE, Building Research Establishment Digest 479, Timber Piles and Foundations has some good advice. It's also got some good anecdotal stories in there. Um, where, for example, as you can see above these pictures, um, there was a coal mine in Australia where timber was a far preferable choice to steel or concrete for piling just because the ground conditions were so aggressive and because timber performs much better in some aggressive uh, soils. It's important to, I touched on this briefly um, with Ben's projects, it's important to choose your timber well. So most timber, regardless of its durability status, status kind of uh, when it's above ground being wetted, most timber is fairly durable when it's below the water table. There are some exceptions. Exceptions. So, so if you've got a high water table, then a timber pile could be really uh, a really good idea. Even without a hub, even without a high water table, then a timber pile might be still a very good idea. But you might have to be a bit more careful about protecting the timber or using uh, the correct species of timber to make sure that the bit that's more susceptible to decay above the ground water table um, will last as long as you want it to. Uh, these the pictures here are uh, from a project we did in Costa Rica some years ago again, um, and it was a local hardwood. In fact, actually in, in places like Costa Rica, Australia, it'd be termites, which are the, which are the issue, not, not so much the uh, decay from water. Um, and I'll also touch on, I think a couple of people said so far uh, this, uh, this evening, um, but there's all kinds of examples of, of well-established buildings sitting on timber, buildings and structures. The Brooklyn Bridge um, rests on uh, timber caissons with a design load of 80,000 tons. Uh, in um, Tobacco Dock, and this, is, this touches another point which no one's mentioned so far this talk, and I've forgotten to mention until now, which is the lowest carbon uh, foundation is a reused foundation. Um, so it doesn't really matter where it's made from, but if you can reuse your foundations on a, on, on a previous site, you're doing really well. And Tobacco Dock in London, uh, they in 19, late 90s, they used um, the existing Scots pine piles to re-support new building. Uh, I'm pretty sure in um, Venice in about 1900, they built rebuilt a building on a thousand year old piles. Uh, and again, as long as they've been continually submerged or in wet soil, they're likely to last pretty much indefinitely. 
Uh, there, are all, there are quite a few uh, UK timbers that are suitable for onshore piling, which is what we're talking about. Um, marine piling is a different case. Um, uh, but for example, Douglas fir, Scots pine, larch, oak, elm. Um, but do take advice. Uh, and uh, I hope to see many more um, timber piles. We're looking at a project now in London uh, for a council where we'd hope to switch our steel piles to timber piles. So the, the galvanized steel screw piles we looked at earlier do have an appreciable amount of carbon in them. They're better than concrete generally, but um, still quite a high embodied carbon um, uh, intensity. So, so swapping those out again for timber would, would, would make a significant difference. And I'll come back and talk about those when I've done that project. But for now, that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, great to see so many case studies. And I think that it kind of opens up our um, Q&A session. Um, we've seen the, some of the questions come through in the chat. Please don't be shy. Uh, feel free to ask the guys um, and Beth, anybody, who, any questions you have. Um, and thank you to other people who've been answering people's questions as we go through. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to start off with a kind of more general question um, about, I mean, ev everyone here is sort of uh, bought into the idea that concrete first isn't the right option. Um, and I, so I just wanted to kind of ask speakers generally, what are the biggest barriers to, to using low carbon foundations and how can they be overcome just based on the amount of experience that you've got kind of using alternatives? Um, maybe we start with Beth first. Yeah, I think from my perspective for the sector that I work in, which is mostly domes domestic, um, it's um, skill sets and, and buy in from builders. Um, it's it's a lot like Steve mentioned, it's, it is generally a lot more effort um, in terms of labor to to do these things or in terms of knowledge or finding specialist contractors to do certain things. So that, from my perspective, is the biggest one. Yeah, Steve, do you want to follow? Um, I mean, the simple like we've almost always been building timber ground floor slabs and it's normally cheaper than concrete and, and builders are normally okay with it because it's quite quick so in terms of the smaller the kind of domestic projects then that um works quite well and then having having pins so i think the, the big like quite big wins are really easy and they're really you know for example um yeah, I don't know. I think, but I think in medium medium sized buildings, the tendency to use concrete frames, brick, concrete basements. I mean, the sort of New London vernacular standard housing is so high carbon, and getting people who are in a kind of production line of making those things with a lot of big established, an established procedure and an established set of contacts and and collaborators in terms of manufacturing those things, getting them to move to to different types of um, material is a risk to their economic model and um, really not very popular. And um, but we're building so many houses in that way. I think it's you know you think building housing is good, saving the environment is good. Does building housing in that way? I, I think there's no reason for the build for houses to be built with brick with concrete frames at all, other than um, perceived value and and god knows what cultural stuff associated with brickwork but um but moving moving a kind of middle-sized residential building away from a concrete frame with a lighter foundation and some kind of lightweight cladding is quite difficult to do and that's um really disappointing yeah i think we're quite conservative as in the construction industry with a small c uh just in terms of change change is hard um Ben and Sean, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think I'd start off by saying you need a kick-ass Dutch engineer, basically. Mm -hmm. It's going to uh, do some we, amazing calculations for you. Three um, excellent examples here. Very yeah. few calculations in Goldfuck, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, no, it's about, like Steve mentioned in his talk earlier, it's about managing risk. And I think the barriers can be can be from the client, they can be from the design team, they can be, you know, from the ground conditions, there are, there are barriers everywhere. But um, I think it is definitely about managing that risk. Um, and obviously cost as well. I think with the project that we presented, that was that was a real big one for us was the, was the cost, the budget was very small. Um, so that really drove the material choices. Um, but I think, because my background is conservation work, 
and I've only ever really dealt with concrete free time periods in terms of maintaining and repairing buildings. So I've seen how things can be done with, with no cement at all. And um, obviously the ones that have failed, you, we, we haven't seen, or we, <laughs> we're seeing a repaired version of something that has failed. But that maintenance and repair is crucial. And I think that's what's got to come in. It's about investing in people, not in high, high price materials. And if somebody ever asks you for a maintenance free solution, they're effectively asking for a high, the highest carbon solution. They're asking for plastic and concrete and steel. So if you go for more sustainable, renewable materials, then you're bringing in people and you're bringing in maintenance and care. And, and that's gonna be a better, a better situation, I think. Yeah, just culturally, that's so interesting, isn't it? Um, Toby, did you have any thoughts? So I'm sorry, I missed the question. Was it was it was the barrier to, to the low carbon uh, foundations? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start just um, picking up on the last thing there from Ben, which is that concrete it doesn't last forever, um, particularly reinforced concrete. Um, lots of concrete buildings above ground are suffering now, um, and they're quite hard to fix. And lots of foundations in the ground will also be suffering. I think the biggest barrier to low carbon foundations are, is, is us. Um, we, you know, design professionals, architects, engineers, need to, to specify low carbon foundations if that's what we want to do. Um, and if, it, if we all do it, we have a movement and it happens. And if we don't, it won't. Just on that, where's, sorry, yeah, go on, Sean, you've got a point. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add, um, yeah, what I've found in, because I do sort of resident, residential extensions and stuff as well on the, on the side. And um, yeah, what I've found is like, is there's building control that you have to deal with who mostly like the officers and stuff that you're working with there, they've never really seen different examples of foundations and they would rather not risk it for that on their side of things. Um, so you have to work really hard with the building control side of things. But then there's also um, client mindset and opening their minds up to the alternatives of what you can use because everyone seems to want bricks and mortar at the end of the day and actually pushing a timber frame building is quite difficult. Um, and even through building control, they, they want to um, belt and braces everything when it comes, they're really scared of timber frame buildings being attached to, like extensions attached to brick buildings and everything. So. Um, so yeah, I think what Toby was saying there is all about mindset changes and pe yeah, people actually specifying new types of construction. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so we've got a question for Steve um, from Matt. Um, how easy is it to source stone for stone pad foundations and are there any challenges justifying their use, following on from Sean's question, to building control? Uh, so obviously building control are a nightmare when you do anything that is unusual and and you can get into a big fight and um, it's sort of exhausting. But I think if you want to build low carbon things, you've got to be tenacious and you've got to be up for um, for championing your ideas. Um, somebody asked me, uh, oh, yeah, how long is this um, stone stuff going to last in the ground? Uh, well, it's only been there for 25 million years, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to last for another hundred or not. So I think, you know, that I, I mean, there are millions of buildings with stone foundations all over the world and all over the UK. And, you know, especially solid stone it should be a non question. Uh, in terms of sourcing stone, um, uh, usually, um, well, so it's not like calling up Travis Perkins and asking for some big stone blocks. So it's not easy. You've got to go and hunt for it. Um, most quarries are producing uh, quarries and so the UK does not have the most um, so, well not the most sophisticated it doesn't have a uh, hugely prolific quarrying in its industry despite the fact that there's a lot of stone uh, most of the stone that's extracted is for high value projects uh, Portland and stuff like that or it's uh, conservation related or aggregate um, most of the quarries that produce high value stone are probably ripping out or selling maybe 20 tons for every 100 tons they move out of the ground because people are over uh, over selective about the color. 
So for example, when we did that thing in the summer exhibition last year, we were given the roach bed for free because nobody wants roach bed and particularly the color that they gave us. So they have, so Portland has a huge pile of blocks that they can't sell or sell very cheaply because they're the wrong color. So if you can find a quarry local to you and you can go and find stones that they can't otherwise sell, and then you can be quite flexible on the size and, you know, it doesn't, I mean, you, you want a nice rectangular block for a foundation, but do you really, you could have any shape boulder really and stick a bit of brickwork on top of it. I don't think, uh, so I would say, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, none of these things that until they become really, for example, CLT has become very easy. And so everyone's building with CLT, but CLT probably isn't the best solution for, you know, from a number of, um, perspectives so if you want to do something really good you're going to get a lot of headwind and i think that's uh but we would push uh all clients and it's really surprising some clients who you think are complete reactionaries and are really not going to be down with it are totally down with it and other ones who you think are really green turn out that they really don't care at all so it's very surprising when you push where you get um where you succeed and uh so we always have a bit of a go. And then we, if they're enthusiastic, we warn them that it's going to be a slightly more difficult process. Yeah, so I think everyone being engaged in the conversation is absolutely critical. Um, so yeah, very good point. Um, Beth, I've got a question from you, from Camilla. Um, many examples show buildings lift, lifted off the ground with piles. Is this something we need to get used to as an aesthetic? And are there any thoughts on achieving passive house with suspended timber floor? Um, or thoughts on passive house with low carbon foundation options generally? Mm, yeah, short answer, yes, I think so. Um, that is this seems to be the easiest way to really, like Toby was saying about reducing the, the carbon in your ground floor structure, changing it to timber makes a big difference. And yes, that requires a void underneath it in some in some way uh, that you go about that. We are doing some at the moment where we're sort of digging down to form a void, but then you end up with a retaining wall around that, which sort of, you can do those in masonry, but it, it sort of defeats the object of reducing the amount of sort of materials going in your ground. So yeah, I think the sort of American approach with a sort of crawl space underneath. And there's some research that I don't know the outcome of it exactly off the top of my head, but Mark Siddle um, from LEAP and the AECB, he's done some really good research onto the the, the, the size of that void. Cause mm -hmm. I think realistically, particularly if it's a super insulated ground floor, like a passive house ground floor, the void uh, considerations need to be a lot bigger than uh, building regulations minimums um so yeah mark siddle um leap is his practice and um yeah the acb and the passive house trust he's done some um, research with on that um for, through both those organizations um and yes i've got details for having done passive house with suspended timber floors and um or thereabouts um with suspended timber floors um i don't know if you've got time for me to show them now or shall i Talk about we, so at the end of the event we'll send out um a kind of party okay. bag um yeah. and we'll collate the questions in the q a so yeah. um if your question doesn't get answered that's also fine we'll uh we'll make sure, make sure yeah but you can be included with that um yes. question for ben Shaw and toby um for the timber pylon piles was any additional testing needed shall i answer perfect why, why it wouldn't be needed yeah um effectively the, the timber uh, posts for the secret campsite were pad foundations. So we the hole was dug at each foundation position, just like you would for a pad foundation. A pad was put on it, just like you would for a pad foundation. And then a post was put on, just like you would for a pad foundation. And then the lateral loads is codified in the minor works for highways document I mentioned, um, which is very, very simple calculations and therefore conservative. So the quick answer is no, no further the tests were necessary. I mean, the key thing with these things is to make sure the timber is going to last for as long as you want it to last for. I think I can also add to that, thanks, Toby. But we, yeah, we also, as a studio, we we invent <laughs> uh, new materials and we do a lot of testing independently, uh, looking at strength and frost and all sorts of different different kind of parameters. Um, and I did see. Sorry if I'm jumping ahead slightly, but I did see a question about low carbon concrete foundations. And that is something that would need to be tested. It's something that we've worked with quite a lot. Um, but I would definitely stress that this is kind of like sort of last gasp 
thing to use. There's so many better ways, I think, to build now. Um, there are low carbon concretes, and I can talk about that at length with anyone. I, I, it's a really good subject that I, I enjoy a lot. But um, I, I really believe we need to move on from that. Um, but yeah, if there are any questions about that, I can talk about that as well. Yeah, just on the on that same topic, um, Tom was asking: Is the bitumen sleeve bonded to those poles, or is it fit, mechanically fixed? Uh, it's that was a product that we bought called Post Saver. Um, it comes as a five me five meter long wrap which you cut, and it's it's like um, it's a bitumen um, on one side which you heat using a heat gun so that it bonds to the timber. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah. Um, Steve, just a quick one from Georgia. Um, the product you showed us with the stone arch is the underground element. Of underground element. Um, where is that? And do you think you could elaborate a bit more on the project and how that came into existence with the client and um, yeah, the team? It's um, uh, yeah, it's an, I mean, it's a, well, it's an Amitaha project in um, Oxfordshire. Uh, and it's part of a residential house. I'm not at liberty to give too much information about it, I'm afraid, but uh, it's kind of, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, we do, yeah, I mean, we're all, I mean, I guess frequently involved in what you call high-end residential projects. And I think, um, you know, there's something, there's nothing as high carbon as somebody's ridiculously oversized house um, in the first place. But I think those are, um, also opportunities to experiment and try things that are a bit different and a bit more audacious on budgets that can um, can allow you to be a bit more adventurous and spend a bit more time designing. So we, um, uh, yeah. But I do think, I mean, the, the, um, in general though, you know, all underground engineering structures, they're all around and they're all domes and stuff. So, um, hey architects. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> round basements round houses round houses <laughs> everything in nature is round what is this rectangular the tyranny of the rectangle the yes. right angle <laughs> um just another one for uh ben and sean uh can you use non-creosote so timber for a pile foundation and remove the lead for the bitumen um and also how do you deal with that critical i guess this one for toby kind of back on the back of that how do you deal with the critical in interface between the below and above ground levels in venetian buildings like is that stone what is that or how did they do it in the past wow uh <laughs> i'll just quickly say i guess specifically for the project that we presented um we had to go for the lowest cost timber and it was how much? It was £2.50 per foot. £2.50 a foot. Which is very, very, very cheap. It's extremely <laughs> So that's that was the driver for that. Um, you, I'm sure you, you can use put, wood. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, telegraph poles are chosen because they're straight, they're grown straight and round as softwoods. Um, but, like, my experience, um, like, learning to cut down trees and stuff, I've learned that chestnut, for instance, sweet chestnut is something that we use for fencing all around Sussex, and you can just put that in the ground and it will last 15 years without any protection. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's also, I think Toby reeled off some species of timbers that would do well in the ground. Um, it's just, just so happens that telegraph poles have been soaked with creosote to, you know, preserve the timber over a very, very long time. So it was a great resource to reuse um these poles have been taken down for whatever you for whatever reason um and then uh, sort of farmers and agricultural fencers all all working around here um like to buy them because they can um be used for putting up gates and things like this so it's being used in the sort of agricultural world at the moment it's just how we bring that into using them as a building um, material. And um, yeah, and we had to go through, before we put any of them in the ground, I just really wanted to make sure that we could get it through building control. Um, and we used a, we, we were told we had to use a BBA approved product, um, which was a, a paint that um, Ben found actually, um, 
And I also found another product because um, I really liked the science of it um, called Smith's Penetrating Epoxy Sealer um, just to sort of belt and brace it before. So once I got the poles, I applied that before and then and then the paint went on that. And then since then, we haven't seen any sort of um, like any forms of sort of sweating or anything like that, that we would risk that was part of the risk um along the way and also like because of this hot weather there's just so much monitoring of the materials that i do on site um yeah yeah so that's that, that's that. yeah I, I'd, I'd be wary of using almost every timber you might find in the uk <clears throat> uh, without protection at ground level um it will rot quite fast if you're not careful and i've seen treated timber rot quite fast at ground level um as well, not all timber treats easily. Some is harder to treat than others, and even even the stuff that's sold as having uh, being used class four, if you're in a critical location, it's wise checking the penetration of preservative that's got into the sapwood. Um, there will be some tropical hardwoods. I imagine that would perform much better. Um, maybe even find some reclaimed um, tropical hardwoods. You'd have success without using any more further protection at ground level if you're above water table. In the in the in the BRE digest I refer to, they advise, well, they give one option is to stop the timber below water table and extend it in concrete. Um, so using concrete, but far less than you'd use if the whole pile was with concrete. Hey, Which is on, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, which is the way that they did the Venice, um, the, ben, the picture that Ben showed, the, the junction between um, a, a water level or, or the ground and the air is masonry. And that's what they were building in those holes in the picture that Ben showed. Um, so, yeah, that's the junction and the timber is completely submerged all of the time. Good to know. Um, just a quick one. I mean, probably for Beth, unless anyone else has got any experience in this, um, what thoughts do you uh, you have for using earthen floors onto recycled glass insulation as an alternative to suspended timber, um, as timber in brackets still has quite a high carbon footprint. Oh, so earth earth floors or lime? Yeah, earth, fl earth floors with like the glap or kind of broom glass insulation. Yeah, um, yeah, we've done that. Um, I'd say that for a um, for a ground floor, um, yeah, you know, depending on the site conditions obviously but um yeah i do get people asking me if they can do that for raft foundations and unfortunately there's just not the data there for using limecrete um in a structural capacity in in that way as a foundation for a ground floor it's generally okay uh depends on obviously the site conditions like i say but um yeah for um yeah for ground floors that's generally a, an approach that can be used Toby's could, got something could, yeah could i add to that um I suspect you'll find that a suspended timber floor with a, with a natural insulation, um, wood fibre or, or paper-based or anything insulation between between the um, joists is far lower carbon yeah. than a limecrete lime uh, slab for sure. And probably even an earth floor, if it's on foam glass insulation, foam glass is quite a high carbon insulation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, what, you're, what you're saving the earth over the floor, timber floor, you'd more than lose in the insulation below the earth. Good to know. Um, Steve, what research and, and everyone, uh, what research needed going forwards to develop techniques and details further? Um, well, I think we, uh, well, so I was talking to someone at, um, or someone at BSI and they were saying that they only make codes where there's a, um, where there's a market for the code. So they only, what that means is they only make codes of practice for materials that are commonly already in use. Therefore, materials that already have codes of practice. And so if we say, for example, are you going to make a uh, reinforced stone design uh, pretty standard or something? I mean, there's, nobody's going to do it. I mean, the, even the um, structural glass was a bit of a big movement in the 90s, and there isn't even proper coding for that yet. You know, and you have bits of design manuals, and so there's a huge lack of um, uh, of movement into those areas. I think there's a kind of pattern complex of 
you know, industry is composed of big concrete and steel manufacturers, and they are paying for people to do PhDs in those subjects. And therefore, universities are stacked up with people who are experts in steel and concrete, and therefore teach steel and concrete. And I think it's only recently that universities have been embracing other materials. But um, but we have to do every, everything we do in stone is from first principles, and quite often things like um, composite timber and stone, sort of like um, uh, mixing timber and stone in a uh, way or other hybrids, very difficult to find um, information about those things. So there's a huge, I mean, all, all of the stone stuff that we've done, for example, we have an R&D budget of about three quid and uh, we'll just go and make tests for the fabricator. And, um, and But actually in, a, in the nascence of a new, or a new you know, stone is not a new material, but in the kind of growing use of the material in our context, um, little bits of testing reveal quite a lot yeah. compared to knowing nothing. So, um, but I think if, you know, if the government were, construction is a huge part of the of the global warming problem and the government's solution is build a load of nuclear power stations which is a bit like saying your boat is leaking go and buy a bigger pump with a lot of know, concrete than, whereas actually it'd be much much quicker and at less risk and cheaper to invest in um lower carbon ways of um building and i think what what ben was saying is is fascinating because it's something that we would thinking about as well and also connected to Barnabas Calder's um work that uh everything pre everything built pre-fossil fuel era which is about 250 years ago is built with an absolute fraction of the carbon of anything built since then and um we should really with modern techniques be able to rediscover those materials and use them in very effective ways and it wouldn't take a massive investment by the government to to codify research and provide us with um, uh, provide us with a framework to, you know, get over, you know, imagine we're building control, building control is an extension of the government and you have to ask, argue for hours and hours and hours for them to take a bit of concrete out of, or to allow you to remove a bit of concrete from the ground. Um, and then at the top of the government, they're going on about the green transition and let's build a nuclear power station. So it just doesn't seem to me very, uh, sorry, that's just turned into a total rambling one. No, it's super right. interesting, and I'm sure I can see everyone nodding. So I think we're all in agreement. Yeah, go on, Ben. Uh, yeah, just want to add that sort of on, alongside research um, and top-down kind of change of <laughs> thought patterns is um, we, we work a lot, I guess, with precedent. And if you can kind of it's understanding what's been done, what's out there, what what people are doing right now, um, and using those as precedents to to get things passed. Um, and I, I would really advocate sort of looking back into like we we're just discussing then historic techniques uh, as precedent for for kind of new ways of working. Um, and it doesn't have to be in a kind of reenactment way. It really can just it's about how you can be in, ingenious with this limited palette of materials. Um, but yeah, precedence for us is a big part of how we would sell or bypass or persuade people to to do things. Brilliant. I'm conscious of time, so probably going to last couple of questions. Um, I just want to touch on um, the kind of cultural transition of or cultural understanding of, kind of material value versus kind of human value, human labour value. Um, so we thought it was really interesting that you mentioned human work hours reduced over the preferred use of machinery. Um, and Anna's really interested uh, to ask whether we should be returning to a more kind of manual labour. Um, I don't know who wants to answer that. Maybe Steve again. We just did this. Um, I, I find that really. I mean, it's what also what Ben, um, what Ben and Sean were saying as well. Yeah. But we were just we just did this um, pavilion for the LFA in um, in the Crystal Palace Park, craft, craft not carbon, and um, we were building a big roof over a, a community centre in India, and they wanted to build it with aluminium. Uh, initially, the idea was to build it with aluminium panels, and we suggested timber, and they're saying, no, termites are going to eat the timber in two minutes. And then we saw a guy by the side of the road weaving baskets, and it's like, we're going to spend 200 grand on aluminium panels. That guy earns 2,000 pounds a year, apparently, so we can employ, employ him permanently for 100 years, making and renewing woven panels on the building, rather than... Um, cough up 200,000 pounds for aluminium straight off the bat and have it. So that's making, 
So I don't, not espousing 2,000 pounds a year as a great uh, wage, but the, the idea that um, you maintain a craft, you create employment, you get rid of a load of aluminium that you didn't have to use in the first place, and you have something which is far more humanistic. And um, I think that idea of um, embracing maintenance uh, can save a lot of carbon. The old, the oldest timber building in Britain, I think, and Ben and Sean will no doubt correct me, is Thaden uh, Bois Greenstead Church, which apparently is nearly 1,200 years old. And um, as Toby was saying, all of the concrete um, viaducts are falling to pieces around us. So people who say, oh, well, I want something durable, I want concrete. You know, it's like, uh, oh, it's nonsense. You know, if you want something durable, why don't you just take care of it? You know, if you love it, it will survive. If you don't love it, it'll fall to pieces and disappear, which is probably not a bad Darwinian way of um, deciding which buildings we're going to keep and which ones we're not going to keep. All those Japanese temples, you know, in Japan, and uh, you know, maintenance of of less durable materials is a far better better way of preserving a building than uh, the Grand Mosque of Jemmy, where they ceremonially slap another layer of mud on every year you know it's a beautiful a beautiful example of sort of social social maintenance a community looking after a building um yeah i think maybe we need to have another event uh with uh on the natural materials and maintenance and care and just kind of yeah because it is like you say it's a whole topic of changing a mindset about permanence versus care attention detail you know all of those things i, I totally agree and i think um that's the difference between, for me, working on from conservation world to then going on to a modern building site. And it's the it's the kind of the craftsperson is is given such a high kind of respect, and they, their decisions can be heard and they can talk directly to the design team. Uh, on a modern construction site, the builder has no voice really, um, but also there's a real kind of value put on the material. So partly because a lot of it's archaeology that's coming out, but if you kind of take that mindset of the material is the most valuable, precious thing. And bring that onto a modern building site with also giving the builder more voice uh, and allow to kind of use their craft in, to maintain and repair and build. And I think that's a, gotta be a better way forward for sure. I think that's a fantastic place to end. Um, so I'm gonna round off there. Thank you ever so much everyone for speaking. Um, it was really interesting. And yeah, I'm glad we spoke about um, the kind of human and, and material um, and craft at the end, because I think that's critically important to do with not just foundations, but natural materials in general. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Aurora quickly just to close up. So thank you everyone. Thanks Steph. And um, thank you to our speaker for a very interesting conversation. And finally, thank you everyone for joining tonight. It's been a real pleasure to see so many of you here.